of that particular plant that's in the Museum of Turin. So this is more what it looked like according to the shroud information. All right, we also know that the, the scourging took place in this position with a tall man and a short man because of the angulation of the blows. All right, tall from one side, short from the other, and you can see where the, um, the Roman flagrum actually broke the skin. But there's no, there's no lash marks on the hands and upper arms because it didn't quite hit the angle of the blow. All right, so here we have 120 scourge marks back and front all over his body. There's a ponytail. There's the marks of the, of the, the, uh, the, cra the crown or the cap of thorns. And here we have the Roman flagrum of leather, little wicked instrument that has lead barbells on the end of it. So if you saw the Passion of the Christ, that was pretty accurate. So here's a, a life-size uh, picture of the back of the shroud with the actual uh, sc scourge marks in the shape of a dumbbell and the dumbbells of the Roman flagrum that taken out of the museum exactly fitting in those positions. All right? Now, next thing. There's no way a human being that was scourged and beat up to an inch of his life could have carried an entire cross all that distance. The shroud agrees with that. All right? The shroud says that there was a piece of wood on this man's back, and, and you're going to see the marks on the shroud that show he carried the patabulum, not the stipes. All right? All right. So here you have scourge marks running one direction, then you have scratch marks or abrasions where the wood seems to have been rubbing on those scourge marks as he walked. All right, and even that weighed 100 pounds. So that's why he fell down many times and probably needed help. All right, okay, now here we go to my opinion, scientifically not refutable evidence that this whole thing is real. All right, we all have heard about nails in the palm of the hand. We see it in every crucifix, we see it in every picture, but that is impossible. There's no way a nail in the hand can support the weight of a human being, 90 pounds on each arm, all right? That's been done. In the days when you were allowed to take a cadaver and string them up, you, they would just break through the hand tissue, all right? So that's the typical way it's been presented forever. However, the shroud shows incontrovertible evidence that the nail went through the wrist. If the nail goes through the wrist, it supports the weight. It had to go through a place we call desktop space, and you can find it on yourself by pushing right here, and your finger will go into a hole where there is no bone. So the other hard to believe fact is the nails didn't break anybody's bone here. All right, it went into a space. So in that space, desktop space, it goes in there and it totally transects or breaks the median nerve. The median nerve controls the muscles of your thumb. To move my thumb, I'm using my median nerve. Well, if you put a nail here, it cuts it, all right? So the reason the man of the shroud has no thumbs is because it went into spasm and went under his hand into spasm. So when the image was formed, this is what showed up on the cloth, all right? So we go back to the medieval guy. He knew this. No. All right, here's one nail into the left foot, going into the right foot, right between the metatarsals. The cap is easy to take off. We saw that actual nail in the museum. So you can get to the next crucifixion. All right, now the spear in the side. This is all correct, too. <laughs> this is amazing. All right, so the body of Jesus supposedly was dead, and to, they didn't break his legs, and to prove that um, he was dead, they stuck the spear in his side. All right, now, did that really happen? The shroud says yes. So let's explain why we know yes. If you take blood from a person and you put it in a test tube and you don't touch it, you just let it sit there for two hours, no air gets exposed to it. What happens is the red blood cells sink to the bottom and the remaining stuff at the top is called plasma, not serum, plasma. So it hasn't been exposed to air, so it's called plasma. So he was bleeding for hours and hours into the um, pleural space which is a sac around the lung. So it, essentially it's a, it's a potential space that with torture fills up with blood and it was filling up with blood, impeding his breathing. He couldn't take a breath in or out well. But after he died, that all blood just settled. So the red blood cells went to the bottom and the top was the plasma. So we have a depiction here between the fifth and sixth rib going in. And so with it, when it first went in, it hit that column of blood so what came out first was blood, then water. The Bible's totally right in that order. Blood and water. They thought it was water because they don't know what plasma was. Here it is on the back of the shroud on the right side of the body, kind of watered down blood all along the area. And right about here is where the sword went in. Okay, 
So, you do an autopsy on this man of the shroud, right? What do you get? He's 5 foot 11, he's 170 pounds, he's about 30 to 35 years old. He died from asphyxiation, a swollen abdomen proves that. His major abrasions on the back right shoulder, he's severely scourged, he's beaten on the right cheek, his scalp ble blood greater than 18 bleeding sites, he's nailed through the wrists, not the palms, he's nailed through the feet, his thumbs are missing, his legs are not broken, he's pierced through the right side, he's in a state of rigor mortis. So in 1500 somebody did all that. All right, so between 1978, 100 studies prove the shroud is real. What happens in 1988? Carbon dating. Carbon dating gets done, tells all of us we're nuts. This is all baloney, and there's no such thing as a shroud of Turin. It's a fake. This goes worldwide. The linen was harvested out of the ground somewhere between 1260 and 1390. The real scientists are destroyed. I'm destroyed. I've been duped. There we go. Give up. 13 years later, all the people calling up the scientists are saying, well, there's too much algae on it. It's dirty. It's, you know, you've got to clean it. F f all kinds of reasons on why the shroud carbon dating was wrong. And they w received the derogatory name of the lunatic fringe. That's what they called the, the believers. Better believers than me. The lunatic fringe. One of the lunatic fringe people, 2001, Sue Benford, a nurse. Not a physicist, a nurse. She finds an interest in this. She's not even Catholic. She's not even Christian. She starts asking for photographs of the sample that was given to the laboratories to do C14. So she's looking at the photographs, trying to find something wrong. And after almost a year of looking, which it, I never would have done, <coughs> she notices a weave problem. There's a problem in the weave, and I'm going to show you that. So this is the actual sample that went to the laboratories, all right? And you can see, maybe from far away, a lot of white tufts that are in perfect rows very lined up like a military parade and over here they're kind of more uh, disheveled, uh, ragged looking, not quite strong enough like the beautiful white stuff on this side. Do you appreciate that? Yes? Alright, here's a close-up. So in the close-up you have the original linen of the shroud, the way the series goes with the nice white tufts, you know, of cotton let's say, and narrow channels all lined up nice and white and here we have them they're kind of beat up with the big channels on the other side because this is cotton and this is linen so she theorizes that there was a patch job and the sample that went to the labs was cotton on one cloth and linen on the other cloth stuck together so the sample was not pure linen did you get that okay all right so here's here's what happened the international protocol said six sample sites. This is them taking the sample. Instead of doing what they were supposed to do, according to the international protocol, the Turin officials changed it to one sample site. So at the last second, without telling anybody in the world that, that where they previously agreed, they took one sample. They took one sample from the corner, which is a great place because that's where everybody hangs onto the shroud for 2,000 years to show it. So it could easily have been damaged. All right? And then all this data gets to Ray Rogers, the chemist from um, the... Uh, of the NASA facilities and he does a study with his buddies for four years looking at the original carbon-14 and other sections of slide and she looks at the material microscopically and he finds in the sample carbon-14 cotton mixed with linen he finds cotton sewed together end to end each each fiber cotton touching linen and this was the medieval tapestry time of, of the Europeans in France. So this was the best sewing people that ever existed. And then another section, original linen and cotton, but dyed. In fact, it's dyed a little too much to make it look match the yellowness of the shroud. So this is now accepted science. This has gone all over the world. All the scientists believe this. Nobody's refuted this. So this is what got me excited and doing these talks because the shroud is back because of that. It was a patch job. So it wasn't the lab. The labs did a good job because they were given garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. The sample was flawed. A re-weaving was responsible. That's why I'm here today. All right? What, how much time I have? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Woo! Okay, ten minutes. It might be time for questions. All right. So I'm enthusiastic. The world's enthusiastic. And now we're going to knock your socks off. All right, Ohio State University Conference, 2008. These are, I'm going to boil down all more what they said into something that's really going to fascinate you. All right, now, this is our best guess. 
in 2014, well, all we know about physics and chemistry and photography and everything else to say how the image got on the cloth in a 3D formation. All right? Remember, it's just a bunch of theories. All right. So we are, we are given, like in chemistry class, a cloth. We have an image on the cloth. We got to figure out what that is. That's real. Okay? There's something in real in front of your face. What is it? All right. So first thing we got to deal with are the facts that I just explained. So the facts, again, no ear, no cheek, blood in the hair, blood doesn't bleed, teeth showing, uh, hair not tucking, che touching cheeks, hair looked like a hair blower hit it. All right, all those things got to be explained. So that's five characteristics. And then even more detail that you haven't heard that I maybe have time, but I'm going to go through it quickly. The radiation effect on this image is perpendicular.